Okay, I thought uh, today's class is concerned. I was told by one of the PAs on uh, Friday that there were a number of doubts regarding timing analysis. So what I'm going to do is sort of do one more example of timing analysis for here in class today. Hopefully some of the concepts will become a bit more clear. If you have any doubts, please feel free to stop and get them clear. Right? The whole point of going through this exercise is that any specific doubts in that area are clear before the exam. Okay? The exam, as all of you know, is on Wednesday as per institute schedule. Please make sure that you know your classrooms ahead of time. I believe it should be the same seating arrangement as per quiz, but I am not entirely sure. So please double check that before you come. Don't have any last minute confusion about which room you are supposed to go to. Okay, so like I said, I am going to take up one example of timing analysis. Okay, this is once again a toy example. Don't worry about the functionality of what is being implemented over here. All that I care about is the topological, the arrangement of the gate, how they are connected to each other. Okay. So a fairly simple circuit, four combinational gates, two flip-flops. I am assuming that these are edge-triggered flip-flops, positive edge-triggered. One thing to note as far as this diagram is concerned is, I have drawn the flip-flop the opposite to what you would normally see, which is that the input is from the right and the output is from the left. Okay? Hopefully that doesn't confuse anybody. Just keep that in mind. All the gates that we are considering are unidirectional, right? So the direction depends, I mean, which way you are providing the input and where you are taking the output from does make a difference, okay? Alright, so what are the questions that we can ask as far as this circuit is concerned? In addition to this, I also have the information that for the flip-flop, setup time is 3 nanoseconds, hold time is 2, and TCQ is 3 nanoseconds. Okay. Subject to this, I am interested in finding out certain things such as what is the maximum clock frequency that can be, the maximum clock frequency or the minimum time period that can be used for this system safely without causing any timing errors. Okay. What is the setup and hold constraints that I need to apply on X? with respect to the input and that is the input x with respect to the clock ok and what is the delay that I can expect from after the clock is applied to the flip clock what is the delay I can expect to see before the output y becomes changed ok so those are the typical questions that I am interested in answering when I try to do a timing analysis ok now the way that this would be, or the systematic way that we can go about this is to essentially say let's first try and find out what are all the different kinds of paths that are present in this circuit. Okay. So one set of paths that we are interested in starts at a flip flop, go through some combinational logic and end at a flip flop. Okay. I will call those the 
आर तो आर पार्ट द रजिस्टर टू रजिस्टर पार्ट ना वॉट आर द पार्ट कट इन एज फार एज दिस वॉट आर द पार्ट कट इन एज क्यूवन क्यूवन क्यू टू क्यू वन यू वन डी वन एक्सैक्टली दट सिंपल द मोस्ट ऑब्वियस पार्ट कट इज टेकिंग आउट राइट देर राइट So we have one path over here. This is an example of a path which starts at the output of a flip flop, goes through some combinational logic, and comes back to the input of a flip flop. Okay, in this case, to the same flip flop, but that does not matter. So Q1, U1, D1 is an example of an R to R path. Right? What is the delay through this path? First, after the clock is applied, it will take three nanoseconds for the output to appear. That is TCQ. Then, the delay through U1, which is again three nanoseconds. And then I have the setup time, which must be satisfied at D1, which says that before the next clock edge arrives over here, I must leave again three nanoseconds for the data to be stable. So the total length of the path, as such, the actual length of the path is only. The TCQ plus the combinational delay of the XOR gate, but when I am concerned with finding out the clock delay, that is the maximum clock frequency, I must also take the setup time into account. So in this case, that's the only thing that I am concerned with. So I straight away add that also into the path delay itself. Okay. Usually you will find them separated out. The delay of the path and the setup time are kept separately. It doesn't matter which way you do it. You need to make sure that as far as actual Constraint is concerned. There is the delay through the logic and the setup time. Both are being taken into account. Okay. So in this case, what we have is the total delay across this is basically nine nanoseconds. Tcq equal to three, XOR delay equal to three, and setup time equal to three. All right. Any other part? Just proceed in the same way, right? In general, what you should do over here is the so-called static timing analysis, which is to say you redraw the graph in the topologically sorted manner. You essentially break up all the flip-flops, take the outputs of all the flip-flops, then proceed through them, right, stage by stage or level by level, accumulating the arrival times of the signals at each of the logic gate outputs. Now, this is a simple enough circuit that you don't need to do that. We can just enumerate all the paths through the circuit. So that's the approach that we are going to take over here. Okay. So the next path that I can see is from Q1 again. The output has to go through U1, but then it can go through U2 and then we D2. Okay. So from Q1 to U1, U2 and D2. Okay, the total delay through this path, TCQ plus delay of U1 plus delay of U2 plus T setup of D2. 12 nanoseconds. Okay. Now, if you look carefully at the circuit, you will see that that's it. There are no other paths that start from Q1 and end at a flip flop. Okay. Remember what I said earlier. You never pass through a flip flop and continue a path. The moment you reach a flip flop, your path has terminated. The flip flops are barriers. They essentially prevent data from going through more than one flip flop in a given cycle. Okay. So which is why we are interested in starting at a flip flop. But the moment we reach another flip flop, we end. We terminate that path. Okay. All right. Now let's move on to Q2. From Q2. The output straight away goes to U0, the AND gate. From there, it goes through two different paths. One is through U1, the other is through U3. Okay, we have to consider both of them separately. Okay, so what we can see is there is a path going from Q2 through U0 and U1, and then going to D1.
So this has delay three nanoseconds for T C Q, two for the AND gate, one for the sorry, three for the XOR gate, and three for the setup time. Okay, so eleven. Then comes from Q two through U zero, U one, U two, and finally settling at D two. Right, and what is the delay of that path? It's essentially three plus two five plus three eight plus three eleven plus three fourteen. Are we done here? There's one more path, right? Which passes through U six. So that is Q two U zero. Then U3, U2, and D2. Okay, so three for the TC2, two for the AND gate five, plus one for the NOT gate six, plus three for the XOR gate nine, plus three for the setup time. So these are all the different parts that start at the register and end at the register. If you go back and look carefully, you'll see that that there are no other parts. Okay. All right. Now, as far as the question of what is the maximum clock frequency that can be used is concerned, we are not quite done yet because there is a possibility that the delay from the input to one of the registers could be larger than. This. Or the delay from the register to the output could be larger than. This. If it is, then that can cause problems that needs to be handled in a more careful way. But anyway, it, it can also affect the maximum clock frequency that can be used. So let's find out those delays as well, right? From input to register, what are the different paths that we can see? There's one path starting from X, going through U0, through U1, and settling at D1. Okay. As far as this path is concerned, I am going to consider the total delay, but I'll also write down the delay without the setup time because I am also interested in these paths as far as the whole time constraint is concerned. We'll get to that later. Okay. So this path is from X through U0, U1 to D1. I call this the pin to register path. So the first pin to register path is X through U zero, U one, and then to D one. Okay. The delay through this, there is no setup time at X. It is an external input. Or rather, there is no TCQ at it. Most likely, it is coming from some other flip flop, but I don't know. It may also be coming directly from the outside world. I don't have that information, so I don't give it any TCQ over there. Okay. The delay through U zero is two nanoseconds, through U one is three, so five plus the three nanoseconds of the setup time. The five is the logic delay. The next path that I can see like this is U zero, U one, U two going to D two. And there is one more path which goes through U zero, then U three, and U two. And this has a delay of six plus two. Okay. 
and the final thing that we are concerned with is the so called register to pin delay or register to also okay now how do i go from q1 that is the first flip flop output to the system output y remember this is from q1 okay there is no path in this case there is no direct combinational path which leads from q1 to the output okay whereas there is a path which goes from q2 to the output what is it from q2 i go through u0 and u3 okay u2 u0 u3 y and the total delay through this is tcq of q2 plus delay of u0 plus delay of u3 so that 3 plus 2 plus 1 6 okay now as far as the overall timing analysis is concerned these are all the paths that i'm concerned with and i need to find the worst case among them okay all these conditions need to be satisfied right that is to say the delay across these things must be at least one before the next signal can come so all of the ones on the left hand side the registered register delay they essentially say a signal starts at a given clock edge from one flip flop it goes through all this combinational logic then i need to leave so much setup time margin before reaching the last flip flop then i can have the next clock edge okay so the time between clock edges must be greater than or equal to each and every one of these values which means it must be greater than maximum of all the values okay which essentially means that from this we can essentially find out tc must be greater than or equal to 14 which is the maximum yeah yeah pin to pin actually yes that's a good point is raised over here there is also a pin to pin out delay right and in this case there is a pin to pin path over here sorry i forgot about that that also needs to be considered when you are considering the total combination and the timing analysis in this case pin to pin delay direct from x to y through u0 and u3 right this is the pre nano set so so it doesn't change the final result but it's important that you consider okay so tc in this case that is the op- minimum clock period that can be used for the system must be at least 14 nanoseconds as given by the scenario okay all right one other question that i can ask or rather related set of questions is let's assume that i'm getting a clock pulse at something equal to 20 nanoseconds okay what region of operation or that is the what region of time should i make sure that the data must be completely stable so that there are no setup and hold violations at the flip flop due to the input x okay due to the previous flip flops already as long as c is greater than 14 we know that that can be no setup violation can there be hold violations we actually need to check that separately but i'm going to just skip that for now okay what the the question that we are asking is considering an input coming from outside x it must not cause any timing violation at d1 or at d2 okay the clock edge is going to reach the clock the flip flop at t equal to 20 nanoseconds during what interval must the data be completely stable so that there is no setup violation and no hold violation Okay. So let's go back here and understand exactly what that means. This second path that I've drawn over here, 
and just highlight it once again. It's an example of a path from input directly to one of the registers. Okay? What we are saying is the clock edge arrives at that register at t equal to 20 nanoseconds. X could have changed anywhere before that, after that. After that if it changes then we are not concerned with it because that corresponds to the next clock edge. But if X changes before t equal to 20 nanoseconds, what condition must the time of change of X satisfy so that there are no setup or hold violations at D1? Okay, that's the question that we are asking. Right? Now, as far as this diagram is concerned, I am not considering a separate minimum delay or a maximum delay for the combinational logic. I am just considering one delay. Okay? And what that means is, if x arrives at some time t, at t plus 2 nanoseconds, it will be at the output of u0. At t plus 5 nanoseconds, it will be at the output of u1. Okay? So that t plus 5 must satisfy some uh, couple of conditions. One is, as far as the setup time is concerned, it must be at least 3 nanoseconds before the clock end. Okay? If x arrives at time t, or I'll call it tx, it will be at input d1 at tx plus 5. And tx plus 5 must satisfy the set of constraints ok I am also going to write down something that looks a little counterintuitive tx plus 5 must also be greater than t plus 2 for the whole constraint now obviously both of these cannot be satisfied simultaneously Right? I cannot have Tx plus 5 less than T minus 3 and greater than T plus 2 both at the same time. So what I actually mean over here is that the setup constraint is with respect to the previous clock. But what it means as far as this is concerned is a change in X must not happen in that, in that interval from you know some duration just before T. Okay? There is one interval over there where there should be no change in X. Okay. If there is, then there will be a setup violation. So this effectively means Tx must be less than or equal to 20 minus 3 minus 5. Right? Twelve nanoseconds. Okay. Similarly, as far as the hold is concerned, T X must be greater than or equal to T plus two minus five equal to T minus three or seventeen nanoseconds. Okay. So to avoid any confusion. I am going to just consider the setup constraint separately and the whole constraint separately. I don't want to mix them together. Right? Please think about this carefully. What is happening over here is that I am just writing down the setup and whole constraint saying that there is a margin around the clock edge where the data should not change. Right? How do I get that margin? I start from the input, I go through the logic and I reach the flip-flop input and find out when is the clock arriving at the flip flop work backwards from there when should the data be ready ok 
Okay. In the normal operation, the setup time will correspond to one particular clock edge. The whole time will correspond to the next clock edge, or rather to the previous clock edge. Okay. So consider the setup constraints together. The whole constraints together. Don't try and mix the two together because then you will end up with a contradiction. Okay. So, if we just write down all the three setup constraints, why three setup constraints? There is one path from x through u0, u1 to d1. There is there are two paths from x to d2. We already wrote these terms, right? We have these three paths. So, what we have is p x plus phi must be less than or equal to. 20 minus 3. Same way, t x plus 8 must be less than or equal to 20 minus 3, and t x plus 6 must be less than or equal to 20 minus 3. Okay. You combine all of these together, and what you get is t x must be less than or equal to 9. So what is this telling you? A clock edge is arriving at t equal to 20. The data is changing, but must become stable by t equal to 9, so that it will not have a problem. As far as setup is concerned, at the d1 or d2. Okay. What does the hold constraint tell us? Combine these, and you get the minimum value of Tx must be greater than or equal to the minimum among these, okay? Or rather, the maximum among these. It must satisfy all the conditions simultaneously. It must be greater than 70. That is the first. Okay. Once again, clock is. The data was stable over here. It starts changing it becomes unknown after t equal to 17. What we are saying is, if it changes any time after t equal to 17, that's okay because the data is already in the logic. It will safely reach the flip flop without losing it. Logic level. Okay, that's because of the way that we have assumed that the delay through the logic is exactly five nanoseconds or three nanoseconds or whatever the number. Is. Okay. Going back to basic, essentially what we have is if there is a clock edge, The data can change before or after the clock, but during this interval, T setup to T hold, it should not change. Right? This is if we just have a clock and X. What 
the previous analysis has said is what i actually have is plot some logic leading to x right which means that the entire diagram just is to the left by corner because any change in x will take that amount of time dx to reach the input of the flip flop right so if i actually look at the input of the flip flop this condition the first condition must be satisfied but if i look at it from the viewpoint of x it is a second condition that must be satisfied it has to be stable for some interval before the edge arrives so that by the time it reaches the clock the condition is properly set up for the properly set for the set up and hold constraints to be satisfied okay all right now all of this is with regard to a regular edge triggered flip flop in the case of level triggered the question that arises is slightly different or there what you are saying is during this phase that is the entire time that the clock is high the lag is transparent okay so typically a level triggered logic will be something like this i'll have one lag with a clock phi 1 some combinational delay after it the second lag will be at phi 2 third lag once again at phi 1 and so on Okay. What is the thing? Essentially, what it's saying is, D1 can start any time after positive edge of phi 1. Okay. What do I mean by that? Any time that phi 1 becomes high, D1 can start any time over here. why is that because when phi 1 is high the data that feeds into d1 is ready okay and d1 itself can start computing okay then must d1 finish where is the output of d1 going it is going to the second lag phi 2 and being used by d2 okay this means that d1 must finish such that d2 has enough time to also do its work d2 must be able to get its inputs ready okay what that basically means is as long as d1 finishes before phi 2 becomes okay right that is d1 must finish before this okay as long as d1 finishes before that point in time it means that the data has come into d2 d2 can start computing when must d2 finish it has to finish so that the next one before phi 1 that is before the 
third lakh becomes opaque. Okay. So rather than an edge triggered flip flop where I say that if I start something, then before the next clock edge, everything has to finish. Timing analysis is very simple over there, right? I start at a given flip flop, I start doing some work, I reach the next flip flop. Before the clock edge reaches that next flip flop, the data must have reached that flip flop. The computation must be over. Over here, with latch risk, it's, just like, it's a bit more tricky. What it's saying is, I start computation out of a latch and after the output of a latch. When do I need to finish? Only before the next latch becomes okay. Because I can actually take some extra time. It's like I'm giving you 5 minutes extra at the end of an exam. Right? All you have to do is finish before the next class starts. Even if you don't finish exactly at 8.50, if you finish by the time the next class is starting, you are okay. You have some extra time. Right? So that window is essentially coming about because these are level triggered latches. Okay? This is the concept of time borrowing also that I had explained in class. So please make sure that this concept is also clear. Okay. All right. Any doubts? Any specific questions before we move back to multiplier? Correct. So the question is. Now in this analysis I did everything assuming that there is a single delay for a gate. So what does it mean? It essentially says if I give an input to the gate, the output will change after exactly that much time. There is no minimum delay and maximum delay. Right? I change the input of a gate, exactly after 3 nanoseconds the output will change. Now in practice that's not how things will work. Right? What will happen is depending on whether the input went from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0 or whether something else was changing at the same time, I could have a minimum delay through the gate which is let's say 2 nanoseconds and the maximum delay may be 3 nanoseconds. Okay? How do I handle that? In this case, the idea is fairly simple. The first question I asked was what is the maximum, the minimum value of Tc that I can use? Right? For that, I am always interested in finding the longest path by which data can reach from one flip flop to another or from the input to a flip flop. Okay? When I am only interested in longest path, the delays that I am going to consider are going to be the maximum delay. Right? The minimum delay in fact comes into a picture only in one place for the whole constant. Right? Over here what am I saying? The clock is changing at time 20. Input data change at time Tx. Okay? Now, I want to know what is the earliest point in time when that change at x can reach the flip flop. Because that is what can cause a hold violation. Right? What does it mean? It essentially means that data change, it very quickly raised through to the flip flop before the flip flop had time to stabilize. So it resulted in a hold violation. Okay? So for this, for this analysis, I would have taken instead of the 5, 8, and 6, I would have taken whatever is the minimum delay from x to d1 and x to d2. In fact, if you consider these two paths, right, and don't worry about the other one, then I would have straight away said that tx plus 6 and tx plus 8, there are already two separate paths by which I can reach the input of d2. Which one is the more important from the point of view of whole time? The 6 nanosecond. Okay, that has to be satisfied. If that is satisfied, automatically the 8 nanoseconds are satisfied. Okay. So the shorter path or the minimum delay 
I need to consider when I am talking about whole time constraint. Okay. The related note is, let's say that I am constructing a so called shift register. What does a shift register look like? It essentially says I have a flip flop and flip flops that are directly connected one after the other. Okay. Now this is the most tricky condition as far as whole time is concerned. Because essentially what it's saying is the same clock is being fed to all of these. Okay. The data comes out of the first flip flop. I have to make sure that it cannot do a hold violation on the second flip flop. What is the condition that must be satisfied? How do I ensure that I don't have a hold violation in this condition? Huh? DCQ itself must be greater than the whole time. Right? The data coming out of the flip flop, it must you have to ensure that the data coming out of the flip flop itself will take a certain amount of time. Okay? And that time must be greater than the whole time of the next flip flop. Okay. This condition is essential. If you don't have this basic condition satisfied, then shift registers will fail. Okay. Luckily, it does not matter too much because the master slave configuration that we usually use for constructing S trigger flip flop typically has a very small value of hold time. It can even be zero or negative. Okay? Alright, so we have very little time left. Rather than going into the topic of multipliers, what I am going to do is briefly describe the class projects that you need to do before the end of the semester. Okay? So the project essentially involves working in groups of I am going to say up to three members at a time. Okay. If you want to work in smaller groups, let me know. Larger groups I don't think make sense because the problem is fairly simple. Right? What you are expected to do is to do a complete design and characterization of at least two gates. One of them is a sequential gate, one of them is a combinational gate. Okay? So for example, let's say that you choose the three input nine gate. Okay? Now I will be sending out examples of what the dot lib format, okay. The dot lib format is something called the synopsis liberty format which is used in order to specify the behavior of different gates in a standard cell library, okay. The kind of things that it specifies are essentially the, what is the functionality of the gate and what is the delays of the gate under different values of input flu and output capacitance low. Okay. You have already done some analysis for what happens for how do I find the delay through a gate. Okay. Now what you need to do is you essentially have to create some kind of a 2D table. Which says, let's say for flu. I am just taking some numbers here 10 picoseconds, 50 picoseconds, 200 picoseconds, 1 nanosecond. So, what does this mean? It essentially means that the input flow, this time over here, is given by one of these numbers. Okay? And over here you will have here load capacitance, 1 centofarad, 
টু ফ্যান্ট পারেন ফাইভ ফ্যান্ট পারেন ফিফটিন ফ্যান্ট পারেন ফিফটি ফ্যান্ট পারেন ফ্যান্ট ওকে দ্য সেট অফ ক্লু ভ্যালুজ অ্যাজ ওয়েল অ্যাজ দ্য সেট অফ স্লোপ উইল বি গিভিং সাম মোর ইনফরমেশন অন হোয়াট ইউ নিড টু চুজ ওভার দ্যাট রাইট বাট আলটিমেটলি হোয়াট ইউ আর এক্সপেক্টেড টু ডু ইজ to characterize for all of these so what does that mean it essentially means you need to apply inputs with these different values of input clue keep a load which corresponds to each of these different load capacitances and find out the delay through the gate okay and fill in this table so that in practice what you would do when you actually wanted to find the delay of a gate so far according to logical effort we just said that the delay of the gate depends on what type of gate it is and of what is the load capacitor in practice there is also a dependence on the input clue that is the input slope okay so the input slope is very it is a very fast changing signal the output will also be fast changing if the input is slowly changing then the output will correspondingly also be slower to change right it's not as pronounced an effect as the load capacitor but there is an influence of the input flow on the output delay okay this is what we need to do as far as the combinational gates is concerned right not just characterization you also need to do the layout in magic followed by extraction then followed by the characterization okay the second part is for a sequential gate right and what do you do you essentially need to characterize the set of time hold time and t c t out of these which one would be the easiest to characterize t c t right t c t is very straight forward you take the value of d to be opposite of whatever is presently at q right so that there is guarantee to be a change let everything settle down apply a clock pulse clock edge see what happens to the output after how much time after the clock edge does the output change okay so tcq is easy to do how do i calculate t setup and t hold can you think of any ways by which you might do it So please go through the reference material, the textbook, various other sources that you can think of in order to find out how to actually characterize the T the T setup and T hold. Typical ways that are used are ultimately what you need to do is keep the data. Supposing you want the data to change from zero to one, right? You keep it at zero. You give a clock edge. Just before that clock edge, you make the data change from one to zero, zero uh, to one. Okay. and you see what happens to the output move that point where the data is changing closer and closer to the clock edge what you should see because of the internal structure of the thing is that tcq itself will get affected right as you move closer and closer the system goes into some unstable state before returning to either a logic 0 or logic 1 so because of that tcq starts to change so there are different ways of doing it you can either look for a certain amount of change in the tcq and put a margin on that and or most of them essentially amount to that essentially say as i move the data change closer and closer to the clock edge how much does the tcq change at that point i will at some margin let's say 5% 10% 20% something like that i say that corresponds to my setup time because if my data change is now closer than this my tcq has changed by more than 10% which is not acceptable okay. similarly for hold from the other side you come in and find out at which point your tcq essentially starts change okay so that's essentially how you characterize t setup and t hold once again you need to do the same thing design the layout extract and characterize okay so this is going to be a relatively long term project and giving you the rest of the semester to finish it this has to be done before the end semester okay but please don't delay
If you try doing it at the last minute, there's no way that you're going to finish in time. Right? You also need to sort of read up and find out what are the best ways of characterizing. So also try and get started on that as soon as possible, get your doubts clear. Form the teams and we'll be sending out a sign-up sheet. Please inform us of the teams in which we'll be working as soon as possible.